You see, I've mentioned David and Linda a few times over there. That's about as far away from me as David can get and still come, <laughs> and still come within my field of vision. But he went to a church that's very well known to me or was well known to me as I, when I became a Christian because it was pastored by the Baker family who were like mothers and fathers of Australian Pentecostalism. Something has happened to the church of your yawning. I, I, I haven't had a chance to be boring yet, Sarah. <laughs> I'll pick the pace up. You're all right. Um, see, God does stuff. And I've seen God do stuff. Who's seen God do anything? Have you seen God? Now, you've seen him do something. Not just a small thing, you know, not just like, no, he does nothing, but not just get your car space, but get your car. You know, like, has he ever done anything significant in your life? Because, beloved, you need to walk in the significance of God because the world needs a God who is significant. And um, I believe in healing. I've seen lots and lots of healing. I've seen lots of healing myself. And I walk around with this foot that I can't even walk on. <clears throat> and every time they talk to me about it, they suck the faith out of me. And so I've got to come back and get before God and get to the place of belief again. But a key I want to share with you tonight, which is not in the talk, but it is from God to me to you. The most important thing you can do for your spiritual growth is not talk um, to God about your problems. He knows them. You need to talk to your problems about God and what he has done. You need to declare over your problems the promises of God. The Bible says that he has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's everything. It tells us that by his stripes we have been healed. Not that we're going to be or not that we can be, but we have been. Five and a half thousand great and precious promises we've been given. And the Bible tells us that the promises of God are yes and amen. And so we find the promise that fits with our problem and the promise is what we talk to God about, not about the problem. I, um, when I came in, into my salvation experience, I was very unwell and very dysfunctional. And one of the things you know or one of the things that you can come to in your life is when you run out of yourself and you say, do I really have to go through this? Is there not going to be someone snap their fingers and the problems will go, well, am I actually going to have to endure this? And um, instead of Abraham that he left Ur, which was a pagan city, looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Well, I went through all the religious system, but I didn't believe. I wanted to believe, but I didn't. And, um, and my parents had a faith, but understand God doesn't have grandchildren. He has children. He is either your father and you, and, and, and you belong to him and you can cry out, Abba, Father, to him or you're an orphan. You have no father. And when I came into this experience, when I came into knowing God, when I gave him my life, there are lots of questions because even though 
I was crazy, I was cool. I had style. And when I first came to God, a man came to help me. And David, he was carrying a Qantas airline bag over his shoulder. Not cool. He already then had to get over that hump in the road with me, the Qantas airline bag. Anyway, he prayed with me, uh, with a group of men, and he got up. I got out of the chair then, and he got in the chair, and he asked for prayer because he had a date that night, and he was nervous. I went home to Tanya, I said, how can these people help me? They can't even take a girl out without having a prayer. <laughs> and, uh, and there was if you like, there was this fringe group of really unusual people hanging around. Now, I was unusual but cool, right? I didn't know that people would know that I wasn't cool by interacting with me. So I came there and when I experienced the first, my first experience of tongues was majestic. I thought to myself, how could these dozens and dozens of people all be singing and they're all singing different stuff, but how did they blend together? And how could they rise and fall together? And I knew it was from God. I didn't know God, but... Um, I knew this was holy, there was something wonderful. What happens is that over time, the church has become too woke. That, that makes sense, doesn't it? Woke, woke people. They, it has become so left-wing and so knowing about everything that what it has done, it's allowed the world to invade it. So it's been invaded by the world. It's been invaded by modern psychology. I'm in the nut house. I'm laying on a bed. And this psychiatrist says to me, you're now dying. You're dead. It's time to say goodbye. And we're just going to wheel your bed into the drawer of the morgue. This is an adult doing this to me, to a crazy person. And, uh, and all these events were happening, right? And, and I'm there, I'm freaking out. I need to make a phone call. I make one on one of those old red phones. And a girl next to me who was sitting in the general lounge, she made a phone call and her boyfriend hung up on her. So she picked the phone up and threw it through the glass window next to where I was sitting. Now I'm in there for rest, recuperation and get my head together. And so I got glass all over me and she smashed the phone. Then she got the end of the red phone and started smashing. I thought, oh, good. <laughs> and, um, and, and so I'm there and I'm, I can't sleep and I'm in a lock ward. I can't get out the ward. So I'm in a lock ward. So I'm walking up and down, walking up and down, walking up and down. I was like Kylie Moore, Moore Gilbert, alone, locked up. So I'm walking up and down, walking up and down. Anyway, the nurse let me walk in the hallway, which was the room to the front desk. So while I walk to the front desk, a man comes in for his methadone. So he comes in for his methadone. They have it in a little cup there, right? But unfortunately, they've got four people's methadone sitting there. So they've got four little cups. When he sees the four little cups, he says, hey, I'm on to something here now. So he, he drinks his, he smacks the nurse in the face and runs out. Now, I'm in there for rest and relaxation. So on the one day, 
I've seen him smacked out on the floor. I've seen the phone come through the glass window. And um, I said to Tanya, get me out of here because I think I could go crazy. (laughs) The reality is I knew that the, the greatest world was the unseen world. I knew that these chairs didn't leave here with us when we went to heaven. I knew that there was that there was more than I was looking at. And so how did I make the journey from this crazy world into the unseen world where I could meet God and have peace? I made the decision to invite Christ into my life. And four days later, after being told I would never work again, I walked out of the hospital. Can you say amen? Now, I share that a bit because it's quite a good story, don't you reckon? And it's powerful. Because you know what? I go back. I'm managing Miranda Fair Shopping Centre. You can imagine how good a job I was doing. So they call me and they say, Someone's gonna wants to jump off the roof. So I go up to the roof and there's a girl there who was in hospital with me suffering postnatal depression. And she's holding on to the railing of the car park about to jump off. I thought, phone smashed through there, man smashed in the face. I don't, Lord, Lord Jesus, if you're real, I can't handle this girl jumping off the roof. So managed to somehow, with a lot of help, talk her back, right? And I saw them put her in an ambulance and take her back right, to the hospital. The reality is the world is crazy. It's crazy. If you want to experience the madness of humankind, Go to the Hazelbrook car park at lunchtime (laughs) and try and buy some fruit and veggies from Totorello's without someone telling you to whatever, right? And so we're in a world that's under a lot of stress where the world we live in has fed fear into the world, has been fed in. Governments have used fear to control us. Governments have sort of, I think, I think, frankly, have told us quite a lot of lies. We'll never know what lies they tell us until we're in glory, then we'll know. But they've told us a whole lot of lies. And I come to God and make the journey into the unseen world. I invite him into my life. I prayed this prayer, Jesus Christ, if you're real, you can have what's left to me if you get me out of here. And hope, hope entered me like a force, like a river. And I'm back at work. And I'm functional. I must be functional because I'm on big bucks, so I'm I'm functional. So, So I begin this journey into God. So I would have to find I couldn't function the whole day. I wasn't that well. And so I would sneak out. I would find a church and I'd go in. So on one church at Eastwood, I crawled in the church was in darkness and I laid on the, che- on the seat at the back of the church and said to God, I can't go on. I, I can't go on like this. I've got a house full of children. I, I, I'm dysfunctional. All of a sudden, the Spirit of God came upon me and time stood still. I entered the timeless world of eternity. And all of a sudden, next time I looked at my watch, six hours had passed, just like that. So began this journey. 
And it all has to do for me with the gift of tongues being set loose into my life, which allowed, allowed me to enter the supernatural at will and still does. So that journey into the eternal realm, what could be called, uh, what could be called the second heaven, the place between heaven and earth, the second heaven, the place of supernatural, the place, the place of um, the place where angelic, the angels uh, travel up and down towards heaven up with the prayers of the saints, down with the answers to the prayers. And as I began to pray in tongues, one of the main gifts of tongues is the ability to bring calmness to your life, to be able to bring mental calmness and mental peace. If the gift did nothing else but that, it would be a tremendous gift. It gives you the ability to be able to pray in a way that you know your prayers are being answered. It gives you the ability to pray in a way where when you don't even know what to pray for. I didn't know what to pray for. And I'd come from a very legalistic religious system where if you said the wrong thing, you could go to hell forever. Like for example, as a young boy growing up, I'd go to communion well, number one, I'd be frightened that I wasn't good enough to go to communion because you were told you were never good enough. And then you weren't allowed to touch the bread with your hands. Well, when it went in your mouth, it'd stick to the roof of your mouth. How do you get it down from that? You've got to put your finger in and get it off the top of your, you know, like all this legalism and rubbish and religion, all of that keeps you away from God like some sort of unholy bodyguards keeping you away from Jesus, keeping you away from the truth who said, who said to us, I am the way, the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except by me. Not that you need a hundred different uh, mediators or a hundred different ways, you, you only need him. And so when I... When I received this gift, I began to pray. And literally, I pray hours in tongues because I've never been going well enough not to, really, when I think about it. Now, we've prayed for this gift a couple of weeks, for a couple of weeks. Some people have got it. Some people haven't wanted it. Um, and some people are nervous about it. He's a bit good for me tonight, Sarah. He's a bit good. When you come, when you come to get closer to God, when you come to know the, the truth of spiritual realities, you'll meet in this other place the darkness that will come against you, principalities of powers that will come against you. Because the job of the occult is to obscure from you the goodness of God is to put religion on you, to put the shoulds, the have-tos, the musts on you, to try and get you to strive to be righteous where you're righteous because of gift. You are righteous as a son and daughter of the living God. You are made righteous by his, by his death and resurrection. You are made righteous. You, you encounter eternal redemption. I was taught when I was going to communion, I had to remember every sin I ever did and repent of it again. 
and again and again and again and again and again and again. It wasn't about receiving the righteousness of God. It wasn't about receiving sonship. You see, the devil doesn't want you to know that you're a son because he'll never be a son. That you're a son and a daughter before anything else. In Romans it says that we don't have the spirit of slavery to fear again, but a spirit of adoption that allows us to cry out, Abba, Father. That's the sign to me, of the baptism in the Spirit is the ability to cry out, Abba, Father. And tongues is the evidence of that happening. It's the evidence. We're told that these signs shall follow those who believe. They shall pray in other tongues. They shall cast out demons. They shall lay their hands upon the sick. That's the sign of belief. If those things are not following you, then there's something wrong with your believing. Your believing's off centre. Or you've allowed religion to get in and talk you out of how good God is. God is remarkably good. And Susie Perkins, God loves you as much today as he's ever going to love you. And no matter how bad you are, he's not going to be taken off you. And no matter how good you are, you're not going to get any more. Because his love's been poured out upon you in Christ Jesus. That's why Michael could look at the door and get touched over and over and over and over again. Because all of us have experienced some sort of spiritual, uh, some sort of pain in our life. All of us, if we see the passion of the Christ, we can have some small glimpse of what it was like for Christ. If you're full of yourself and what you think you've done wrong and blah 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 blah, go and watch the Passion of the Christ half a dozen times. What's the scourging scene and then try and say that your sins are bigger than the power of Christ to forgive you? That's why the crucifixion is so over the top, so ugly, so terrible. So that you would never put your sins above the power of God to forgive you. You'd never put them there. If you want prayer tonight, come and stand here.